Is that really in the Bible? You live in a world where everyone has an opinion about the Bible. Of what values are your beliefs if they are not clearly found in the pages of your Bible? The question we must ask is, are your opinions and beliefs really found in the Bible? Well, hello, I'm David Freeman with Is That Really in the Bible? Recently, I preached a funeral where I shared the pulpit with a Baptist minister, and I, it was a friend of mine that I, the funeral I was preaching, and, and for the most part, you know, when I preach a funeral, uh, I, I tell them, you know, I don't, people, I don't preach people into heaven, okay? What I preach is the resurrection from the dead that Christ returns and that he raises people from the dead. So, you know, I just, I just don't preach people into heaven. And, uh, you know, if they have a problem with that, well, then get somebody else to preach the funeral. But, uh, you know, and there's plenty, I don't have a problem with you getting somebody else. But for me, I just, because I don't believe that people go to heaven when they die, okay? Because Jesus said, no man is ascended to heaven. And I believe Jesus knows more than the preacher knows, okay? All right. So, but anyway, it was sort of funny because right off the bat, he, he, he goes first, the Baptist minister goes first, and right off the bat, I mean right out of the chute, he starts talking about streets of gold, a heavenly home, and this person is now in heaven, and, you know, walking the streets or whatever, and a heavenly home and all that stuff. Well, then I, after he gets through, I get up there and I preach the resurrection from the dead. You know, I preach what I always preach, that Christ returns and the trump sounds and the dead are raised. Well, then we go to the graveside. And uh, normally at the graveside, now I don't know if you ever picked up on this or not. You probably haven't because most people don't really listen to funerals very well. But this is normally what happens at a funeral the preacher will, in the church, say that this person is, is not in that casket. They're with the Lord right now in heaven, okay? Then they get to the graveside, and what normally happens is they preach the resurrection from the dead. They'll open up their Bible in 1 Corinthians 15, and they'll preach about Christ returning and resurrecting the dead. And, you know, most people never catch on to that contradiction. You know, they never say, well, wait a minute, you just said they were in heaven. Now you're preaching the resurrection from the dead. Which is it? But anyway, we got to the graveside, and of course, I preached the resurrection again. I turned to 1 Corinthians 15, talked about the resurrection of the dead. Well, then he closes with, with prayer, and he says something like, Lord, I thank you that, you know, uh, Paul said uh, we are, when, you, when you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. Yeah, absent from the body, and, that, and that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about, because I've heard that statement again and again and again about absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now what does it mean? Does it mean that when you die, you are immediately present with the Lord? Let's take a look at it, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8. It says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, this is how most people interpret this. They say, well, uh, when you die, you are, you are immediately in the presence of God. That's how most people interpret that. Uh, did Paul believe that, though? That when you die, you immediately go into the presence of God. Is that what Paul taught? Is that what Paul believed? Is that what you read in your Bible that Paul believed? Okay? You know, you just can't take this one scripture and, and prove a doctrine. You have to look at line upon line, here a little, there a little. You have to weigh it all out, okay? Now, if people's interpretation is true that to be absent from the body is, is immediately present with the Lord, then that means right now there are billions of people in the presence of the Lord right now, okay? Now, one of the things I think most people never really think about is that if that's true, then really heaven is no different than earth. I mean, when you think about it, because it's what I call heaven's fault. And what I mean by that is when someone dies, you miss them, okay? You miss them. I, well, I just sort of miss that person. But in heaven, 
it's also people that are missed because the family system is always separated from one another. So in heaven, you got people, you know, oh, I sure do miss and so and so. I wish they'd hurry up and kick the bucket and get up here. And then down here on earth, we're thinking, well, I sure do, you know, I miss my loved one. And, and it's, you know, heaven is never satisfied. Have you ever thought about that? That heaven is never satisfied. There are all, there's always someone missing. Maybe you've never thought about that. And so it's not a lot of difference other than being with Jesus. But your families are, your children are missing, a loved one's missing, a husband's missing, a wife's missing. Someone is always missing. And you know, it's strange, it really is strange when you think about it. You know, down here on earth, we will go through pure hell to hold on to life for six more months. I mean, we'll have tubes running out of our bodies, we'll go through chemo, radiation treatment, just to hold on to life for six more months. I don't know why you'd want to hold on to life for six more months, but we do. And then in heaven, you know, they're, they're up there, according to the theory, thinking, man, I wish he'd hurry up and kick the bucket and get up here. It's a strange concept. It's an elaborate concept when you think about it. Now, here's the problem. Absent from the body is present with the Lord, the way people look at this. You have some problems in the Bible, contradictions. First of all, you got Jesus saying in John 3 and verse 13, says this, he says, And no man has ascended up into heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now that presents a problem. Jesus said, no man is in heaven. Okay? And then we just read a scripture, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus says, no man is in heaven. Paul says this over here, all right? And then you have Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5 that says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Ooh. So, so how, do we, you know, how do we understand this? Well, it gets even deeper. It gets even more a little bit complicated because Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7 says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Now, this sort of sounds like, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This sort of sounds like, well, at least the Spirit is with the Lord. So, we have a conundrum, okay? We have what is called a contradiction. And I'm telling you, anytime you have a, a, a puzzle, a contradiction, it's not the Bible's fault. The Bible never contradicts itself, okay? So, anytime you come to scriptures like this, you got to realize it's our interpretation of the Scripture that is in error. It's not the Bible, it's your interpretation of the Scripture. And so we have to dig deeper. Okay, now, this riddle can be solved by asking the right question. Okay, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You gotta ask the right question in order to understand the Bible. Most people never get around to asking the right questions. A lot of people ask stupid questions. They ask questions like, well, I wonder, did Adam have a navel? And was it an any or is it an outie? You know, they ask the dumbest question. And how, how deep is a sea of glass? I want to know how deep the sea of glass is. It, you know, is it that thick? Is it three foot thick? I, you know, I'm thinking, why do you even ask these questions? They're, they're so stupid. But people, religious people, I think it's like a, I don't know. It's just a way to avoid the real issue by asking these irrelevant questions. Okay. Here's the question you've got to ask in order to solve this mystery, to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. You've got to ask this simple question. Can I stand in the presence of God like I am now, flesh and blood? And once you find the answer to that question, everything falls into place. Okay? Can I stand in the presence of God like I am now, flesh and blood? Now, you know, there was a story in the Bible where God said, where um, Noah, no, Moses, yeah, Moses, let me get this right. Moses said, show me your glory. You know, Moses, Moses wanted to see God. Now, I've met people that you know, claim they have seen God. I even saw something recently that some person claimed to had, he went to hell and back or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's some of the craziest stuff out there, some of the con most convoluted, craziest stuff when it comes to religion. You know, the guy, someone claiming he went to hell and back. And he's got, his face is all burnt up. You know, most of my friends that go to hell don't come back to tell about it. I mean, I, just kidding. But uh, 
this is, this is, I think he's on the internet or something. Some guy claiming he went to hell and back. All right. Um, Exodus 33 and verse 20 says this. Here's, you know, the answer. Moses wanted to see God. And he said, God said, you cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Now, why is that? Well, you know, well, Revelation talks about Christ, God being his countenance as the sun shining in its strength. In other words, if you were to see God the way you are now, your eyes would just melt right out of the sockets. You know, it'd be like an Indiana Jones movie when they, op they open up the Ark of the Covenant, and that's what happens. They're born, everything just melted and ultimately came dust that just blew away. Well, that's what would happen to you if you tried to stand in the presence of God the way you are now. In other words, you've got to be changed, okay? John 1 and verse 18 says, No man has seen God at any time. Why? Well, because you can't. You can't see God the way you are now. You would not survive the encounter. Your body has to change. Well, the question is, okay, when? When does this change take place? And if we can identify when the change takes place, we can identify when we're going to be in the presence of God if we can identify when this change takes place, when this body is changed to something else that is able to stand in the presence of God. All right, well, let's try to figure this out. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Notice this, flesh and blood cannot inherit, in other words, Flesh and blood can't see God because you would be destroyed. You would be consumed in the flesh. So flesh and blood, and this is talking about the first resurrection, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You're going to be changed into something totally different than what you are now. You're going to be given a spiritual body. God is a spirit. And you're going to be given a body like His so that you can stand in His presence. Okay. So in order to be in the presence of God, this body has to be changed from, from flesh to spirit, from an earthly body to a heavenly body, from corruption to incorruption, from mortal, what we are now, to immortality, from a natural body, what we have now, to a spiritual body. That change has to occur before you will ever be in the presence of God. Now the question is, when? When does this happen? And if we can answer the question when, we can answer the question when can we, you know, what's the timing of this? All right, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 42. It says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Now, no one would dispute that the resurrection takes place when? At the return of Christ. I don't know of anyone that would dispute that. So we're identifying, okay, Christ returns, and the resurrection takes place, and a great change is going to take place in your body. God is going to do something that will enable you to stand in His presence. Because you're not going to be able to stand in His presence, flesh and blood, because flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot see God. So do you want to know when you will see God? The answer, at the resurrection. And not a moment before. Not a moment before. Let's take a look at this verse. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 54. It says this, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have, shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, did you notice that? It says this mortal, what we are now, must put on immortality. In order to see God, you've got to put on immortality. You can't see God the way you are now. Now, when will we be given immortality? Are you given immortality the moment you kick the bucket? No. 
No, 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 no. That's not what your Bible teaches. Now, if you've been to cemetery school, seminary school, excuse me, you're taught that you have an immortal soul. You've been lied to about the Bible. The Bible does not teach that you have an immortal soul. You've been lied to about the Bible. You are mortal subject to death. That's the reason you die is because you're mortal. And you're going to be given immortality when? At the return of Christ. At the resurrection. Then and only then will you be able to see God once you have been given immortality. Now, Paul understood what death was like. And it's sad that most religious people, I mean, you would think something as simplistic as death. You die, you're dead until Christ's resurrection, until he resurrects the dead. Trump sounds dead and Christ raised. It is so simplistic. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant. And I'm telling you, ignorance prevails in this subject. It really does. And, and look, why does Paul refer to those that are asleep, as death, as sleep? Have you ever been put to sleep? Were you aware of the passage of time? No. And it's like that, and all of a sudden you're coming out of the operation. You know, and now I can just hear some preacher saying, oh, you're talking about soul sleeping. Well, you don't have an immortal soul. So you can't really refer to it as soul sleeping because you're mortal. Again, you don't have an immortal soul. Not yet. And that has to be given to you at the resurrection. All right, let's continue on. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. All right, what is the hope? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus. Notice that. They sleep in Jesus. Why? Why is death referred to as those that sleep in Jesus? Will God bring with him? In other words, he's going to resurrect them when he returns. At death, the spirit leaves the body and returns to God, okay? The spirit is absent the body at death, creating a condition called death, oblivious to the passage of time. You know, the clock of life, when you die, right now your clock of life is ticking, okay? When you die, it stops. You know, for the person who is dead, time does not continue on. It stops. And then at the resurrection, it starts right back where it left off, ticking again. And, you know, it doesn't matter. Paul died, what, 2,000 years ago, I guess, or close to it. He probably died in the arena at Rome. Uh, last thing he's going to remember is being killed by, you know, who knows what, wild beast or however. Next moment, he's going to be coming up out of the grave and meeting Jesus Christ. He's going to be present with the Lord. And that passage of time, you're not aware of it because the clock of life stops when you die. And when you're in the resurrection, it starts ticking again. So, yeah, death is referred to as sleep in the Bible. That's how the Bible refers to it. Now you can make fun of it. You can say, oh, it's soul sleeping, but that's how the Bible refers to death as sleep. Those that are asleep in Christ. Okay. You got a problem with the Bible? Take it up with God. All right. Let's, look, let's explain this verse, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. Like I said, your spirit and I like to refer to it as your spiritual DNA, what makes you you, the record of your, who you are, returns back to God who gave it. But it's not conscious of anything. Now why is that? How do I know that your spirit that returns back to God who gave it is not conscious of anything? How do I know that? James 2 and verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. When you disconnect the two, spirit and body, it creates a condition called death. 
For as the body without the spirit is dead, you know, it, 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 that, that's what you have when you separate the spirit and the body. In order to be conscious of anything, your spirit has to have a body. It has to have eyes and ears and a brain to think. And when you separate the two, it's a condition called death, asleep, oblivious to the passage of time. Your spiritual DNA has to be given a body to be conscious of anything. And that's not going to occur until when? The resurrection, when Christ returns. And I'm telling you, the, the idea of disembodied blobs in heaven floating around in search of a body is just downright ridiculous. It really is. That's not what your Bible teaches. It's not what your Bible teaches. The dead don't know anything. And there's a reason they don't know anything. Because they haven't been given a body yet. That's going to occur at the resurrection. All right. Now, what is immortality? Immortality is this. It is when in this life, your spirit, what I call your spiritual DNA, has been infused with the Holy Spirit of God. And a new creature in Christ starts to develop. All right, this is what immortality ultimately will be. When in this life, and this does not occur to all people, when in this life, your spiritual DNA has been infused with the Holy Spirit and a new creature in Christ starts to develop, then at the resurrection, you are given a spiritual body to match it. That's immortality. And that hasn't occurred yet. No, but it will if you are one of the elect. All right, so Paul says, look, I'd rather be absent from the body and present with the Lord. In order to stand, what we got to understand is this. You know, I, if Paul was here, he would laugh at all the confusion that goes on. He would say, look, I wasn't saying that you immediately go to be at death in the presence of the Lord. That's not what I taught. That's not what the resurrection chapter is all about. That's not what 1 Thessalonians is all about. Didn't you read the Bible about the resurrection? Didn't you read what Jesus said about the resurrection? He, he would laugh at all the confusion that goes on. In order to stand before God, your body has to be changed from flesh to spirit. And that change doesn't take place until Christ returns and the resurrection. So we've identified when we're going to stand in the presence of the Lord. Now, I know this is hard for some people to accept. You know, a lot, I've met a lot of people that want to believe that their loved ones are right now in heaven. I had one woman tell me one time, she said, you know, if I believed my son, her son had gotten killed in an automobile accident, if I believed he was in the grave, I'd go crazy. I don't know why people have such a fit with this. You know, my father passed away in 86, and been, he's been in the grave dead for many years. But he's not aware of anything. And he's going to be resurrected in the first resurrection. But, you know, I mean, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I don't know why people have such a problem with that. The bottom line is this. The only promise Jesus Christ ever gave of living again was by a resurrection from the dead. That's the only promise he ever gave. In fact, I don't have this scripture. I wish I did, but I think it's in Hebrews. It talks about that they without us should not be made perfect. That God has a plan that this perfection is going to occur all at the same time. It's referring to the resurrection of the dead. It's not one flitting off to heaven and then another one and another one. It's the resurrection when family systems and units will be together all at one time. That's the plan that God has. And that's the hope, the only hope, that Jesus Christ ever gave. Read it for yourself. The only hope that Christ ever gave of living again was not heavenly retirement. It was not flitting off to heaven when you die, the only hope Jesus ever gave was by a re of living again was by a resurrection from the dead. I'm going to return and I'm going to resurrect the dead. And that's what's really in your Bible. The Immortal Soul. Millions believe that you have an immortal soul that either goes to heaven or hell when you die. Yet the words immortal soul are nowhere to be found in your Bible. Think for a moment. 
If you already have an immortal soul, then why do you need God? You already have something that lives forever inside of you. Why would you need a relationship with God? The concept and teaching of the immortality of the soul does not come from the Bible. Philosophers like Plato and Socrates came up with the concept as they speculated about the state of the dead. What does the Bible really say about immortality? What do the dead know? What does the Bible really say about the state of the dead? Do the dead know anything? Are they aware of the passage of time? Do disembodied souls roam heaven's corridors? Do spirits of dead people roam the earth? Can you talk to the dead? Is someone listening on the other side? What does the Bible really say about the state of the dead? The Resurrection The only promise Jesus Christ ever gave of living again was by a resurrection from the dead. The teaching of the resurrection of the dead fills the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. There is no greater promise for mankind than the dead being resurrected. However, the teaching of going to heaven when you die has made the greatest promise in the Bible unnecessary. If the dead go immediately to heaven when they die, then why do you need a resurrection? What does the Bible really say about the resurrection? Order these three pieces of literature by writing to Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. That's Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. Also, visit us on the web at isthatreallyinthebible.org.